So in this screencast, we're going to talk about the periodic table a little bit more in its structure and the concept of effective nuclear charge. Now, the periodic table, our first periodic table that we had learned about, was based on the electronic configuration, how the noble gases all have a similar electronic configuration and the alkali metals have a similar electronic configuration. So we put them in columns. There are other periodic tables that have a similar sort of bent in that they sort of show relative locations to atoms. So here's sort of a triangle periodic table where hydrogen and helium are at the top and then as you see hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium and the alkali metals are along this, this line and then the group 2A metals are along this line and elements that are similar co electronic configuration and similar chemical reactivity are connected by these lines. Here's another one here sort of a a three-dimensional version where each end level has its own platform and then this one over here on the right is one of the more screwy ones that I've ever seen where it's sort of like a bunch of hexagons and we kind of go around in circles. This is actually a relatively recent one. I still don't quite understand it and what its power is. But the reason why our periodic table, or one of the many reasons why this very simple setup that's been used for almost 200 years now still is the most prevalent and still in the front of chemistry textbooks is because of the electronic configuration but it's also this particular layout allows us to make certain what are known as predictions based on relative locations of each of the atoms we call these periodic trends which we're going to talk about later so before we can start talking about periodic trends we need to talk a little bit more about electronic configuration and how these things electronic configuration and how it affects chemical reactivity so there are two different kinds of electrons two sort of groupings of electrons here's the electronic configuration for chlorine now chlorine has a noble gas sort of buried in it the 1s2 2s2 2p6 that's sort of our noble gas, sort of what we call the core electrons. And then we have these electrons that in the outermost shell, which we call the valence electrons. Now the reason why we distinguish between core electrons and valence electrons, we've talked about how, for example, sodium loses one electron and becomes like a noble gas, and it only loses one electron. That one electron is the one valence electron in sodium. These seven electrons in chlorine are the only ones that do anything. Those 10 core electrons, the sort of noble gas core, those almost never get touched. They're hard, fast, they don't go anywhere. If any electrons are to be played with, to be shared or given up, they're the valence electrons. So chlorine has 10 core electrons and seven valence electrons. Calcium has 18 cores, so the previous noble gas has 18 electrons. Those 18 never go away. And calcium has two valence electrons. We know this. Calcium's common oxidation state is plus two. And of course, it gets a little hairy when we start getting into the meat of the periodic table, because if we look at gallium, it actually only has three valence electrons. And why that is, we can tell if we go back here and look at our periodic table. So there's gallium. and you have to go all the way back to element 18 to the previous noble gas and so you think oh gallium has um, 13 valence electrons because 31 minus 18 is 13 but you have to remember that to get to gallium part of the electronic configuration of gallium is a 3d10 the reason why Argon is a noble gas is because it has a full p set of orbitals. There's something magical about having a full set of p orbitals. Turns out there's something magical about having a full d set of orbitals. Same sort of symmetry locks everything down. So gallium, if you ignore the 10 electrons that are in this d shell, it ends in a f the electronic configuration ends in 4s2, 3d10, 4p. One, it turns out gallium is common oxidation state is plus three. It's really only got three valence electrons, and there are those two and that one. Those are the electrons that can be lost. These ten electrons don't go anywhere. 
those electrons are stable and cannot really be stolen, if you will. So gallium only has three valence electrons by this description. So it turns out what's going to dictate where these electrons are and how hard they are to remove them is a concept called effective nuclear charge. We can define actual nuclear charge, as it's usually given the symbol Z, which is just the number of protons in the nucleus. And we know that, so here's a, here's a sodium atom with 11 protons, and it's got 10 electrons, our 10 core electrons in sodium, and then we have our one outermost electron. So if we think about what this one lone electron out here actually sees, when the reason why the electron even hangs out is because of that positive nucleus. But that one single electron doesn't see all plus 10, or I'm sorry, plus 11 positive charge of the sodium nucleus because of these 10 core electrons. So the electron, the nucleus might have 11 protons, but the 10 core electrons almost sort of like cancel it out because remember, this electron doesn't like these core electrons. They're negatively charged. So the sodium atom really actually only sees sort of a net effect of plus one. And that is the Z effective, the effective nuclear charge. Even though the actual nuclear charge of sodium is 11, the effective nuclear charge, the sort of net effect that I could see because of those 10 core electrons is actually only a plus one. So we think about magnesium. In the case of magnesium, it's just got one more electron, so there's one more electron out here. And then there's 12 protons in the nucleus. And each one of those, those two outer electrons, they don't get in each other's way because they're in the same shell, but there's still those 10 electrons. But now the effective nuclear charge in magnesium for those outer electrons is there's 12 protons and 10 core electrons. So the effective nuclear charge in magnesium is a plus two. So the outer, put another way, these outer electrons are attracted to the nucleus because of it, the positive negative electrostatic attraction, but are repelled by those core electrons. So the Z effective is a function of the distance from the nucleus, how far away, and the number of core electrons. We can actually sort of calculate a, a value for a Z effective, and a rough and tumble way for doing that is simply taking the actual charge minus the number of core electrons. So as we said, for sodium, the actual charge is 11, but there are 10 core electrons, so Z effective is 1.